This episode was made in collaboration with Marxist Paul. Go check out his video when you're done here to learn about the fundamentally anti-democratic nature of the EU and its built-in laws that force countries into neoliberalism and make socialism literally illegal. Have you ever wanted to travel to Europe? Don't. Everywhere you go in the EU, you can hear this. <laughs> stupid European, stupid laugh, bouncing off their stupid cobbled streets, stupid slanted roofs, and echoing through their stupid and up-to-date public transportation systems. Why? Because they can't stop laughing at us Americans with our racist president who hated brown people so much he invented walls. Well, we sorta got rid of that guy for a couple years. Like, maybe four years tops. So who's laughing now? Still them. Turns out the new guy likes walls too. But in 20 minutes, maybe they'll be laughing a little bit less. For my non-European viewers, you get to sit back and look at them for once. Because this week, we're talking about Europe's own walls and the agency in charge of them. Frontex. But first, an exercise in visualization. This, surprisingly, is an EU border. Well, not really. This is stock footage of the sea. With any luck, it's actually the Mediterranean. Europe's border walls are special because one of the biggest ones is made of water and, by most definitions, is not a wall. Just look at it. You've seen a wall before. This isn't that. You could zoom right past this in a boat without even realizing it. Here, this is what it looks like when it's not invisible. It's a pretty big wall. The EU has just 9,000 kilometers of land borders compared to 44,000 kilometers of sea borders. And the Mediterranean is one of the longest. That matters because every year, thousands of people try to go over these invisible lines and into the countries that lie beyond them. Tragically, tens of thousands of people have died attempting this journey. 40,000 since 1993, and in 2021 alone, around 2,000 people died or went missing in the Mediterranean. A number we can confidently assume is an undercount and yet still represents a 20% increase from the previous year. According to most estimates, that makes the Mediterranean the deadliest border crossing in the world. A mass grave, packed to the brim with people looking for a better life. And unfortunately, this isn't a very controversial statement. Nobody, from the left to the right, denies that the Mediterranean is a violent and deadly border. What they do deny is their role in making it so. This is where our story really starts. Although the Mediterranean is measurably dangerous, it's not so much the Mediterranean itself that is a danger to migrants. The main reason this body of water is so fatal isn't because of its natural attributes, but thanks to the tireless work of the EU and its border enforcement agency, Frontex. You might have heard about Frontex recently after this guy broke up with it. The head of the EU's border agency confirmed he's stepping down on Friday following reports of misconduct and human rights violations. Fabrice Legeri was appointed to the head of Frontex in 2015, as the bloc was dealing with an influx of migrants. That's Fabrice Legeri. He used to lead Frontex until he resigned following allegations of human rights violations. Olaf, the EU's internal anti-fraud agency, claims that under Legeri's leadership, Frontex engaged in the illegal pushbacks of hundreds of migrants. A handy euphemism that makes it seem like migrants are just nicely turned away from EU borders. Like all they needed was a little push. Nothing wrong with a little push, right? Eh, wrong. Calling them pushbacks is ridiculous, when the reality is much, much more violent. In some pushbacks, asylum seekers were taken off dinghies, put into Greek life rafts, and left adrift at sea. But that's not all. According to an investigative report by Joe Sur, a nonprofit helping refugees and immigrants, most pushbacks include brutal violence by border guards including the use of batons, electric discharge weapons, dog attacks, and forced undressing, to name a few. So that's all real bad, and as it turns out, totally illegal. You know, on top of being some of the worst things you've ever heard of and that you would assume would be illegal for normal, obvious reasons, but sadly are only illegal for technical reasons. Basically, asylum seekers are guaranteed a set number of days when they arrive in a new country, during which they are protected by international law while they file their paperwork. Whatever country they arrive in, literally everywhere in the world. At least, that's the idea. International law being what it is, it's more of a theory than reality. As a migrant seeking asylum, once you get into the place you're fleeing to, you're supposed to be set for a few weeks while your paperwork gets filed and handled. And normally, you should be allowed to stay. This is because, in legal terms, pushbacks are called refoulement, which, since it's French, sounds less like a word and more like a really satisfying sneeze. 
The problem for rundown Creed Bratton here is that in international law, there's such a thing as non-refoulement, a fundamental principle of international law that forbids a country receiving asylum seekers from returning them to a country in which they would be in likely danger of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. This is an international law we got after a little event called the Holocaust, during which Jewish people fleeing Europe were denied entry into countries like the US, forcing them to go back to Nazi-occupied territory where exactly what you expect would happen, happened. Pushbacks are an illegal denial of this right to non-refoulement, so Legere got in trouble. But it's not just that. Our friend here got in double trouble because not only did he do the illegal pushbacks, he then pretended like the whole thing never happened and hid evidence from the public. So he had to go. But it would be wrong of me to pretend that violently pushing migrants out to sea was the only horrible thing Frontex did. At its very core, Frontex is one of the big reasons there are so many deaths in the Mediterranean. Although the group boasts that it rescues a lot of people, over 13,000 people in 2020, its very existence has actually served as a justification for letting a greater number of migrants die in the Mediterranean than ever before. How so? Take a look at this CNN clip from 2015. In this clip, CNN is describing how Frontex replaced Mare Nostrum, and how that agency change had dramatic consequences. The Italian search and rescue operation Mare Nostrum saved an estimated 150,000 people over the year it ran. It cost more than $13 million a month and came to an end last November when the Italian government said that without more help from the EU, it could no longer afford to fund it. In its place, the European Union set up Operation Triton, which has a budget of less than a third the size of Mare Nostrum. As part of Europe's border control agency Frontex, Triton's mission is to patrol and secure Europe's borders rather than focus on search and rescue like Mare Nostrum did. Triton vessels only patrol up to 30 miles off the coast of Italy, whereas Mare Nostrum operations went right to the coast of Libya. While Mare Nostrum rescued 94% of migrants arriving in Italy by sea, so far, Triton has only rescued around 20%, with merchant ships now playing a larger role. Humanitarian groups say this reduced capacity is already having an impact on the number of deaths. According to the International Organization for Migration, up to 15 times more migrants have died in the first four months of this year, compared with the same period last year. When Frontex boasts about rescuing 13,000 people, what you need to understand is that they only saved 13,000 people. Changing who handles Mediterranean migration from the hands of a rescue first agency to a border first agency means more people die. It's not something that's up for debate. The statistics are plain to see. And it's not just that. Part of Frontex's deal is reinforcing land borders. The reinforcement of EU borders, especially of land borders, is one of the big reasons people even used the Mediterranean as an immigration route in the first place. Since the 90s, EU countries have built a thousand kilometers of new physical walls over land borders, six times the length of the Berlin Wall. The idea is to deter people from going through them, but harder borders don't really serve as a deterrent to people desperate to escape violent and dangerous situations. They just force them to take riskier paths. Basically, harder land borders means more Mediterranean deaths. Add to that the fact that under Frontex, rescue operations are really just a secondary objective behind this big, important, no one gets through project, and you get more people who could have easily been saved or would have avoided a perilous journey altogether dying tragic and untimely deaths. The EU changed its priorities and as a result, willingly put thousands of immigrants in the crosshairs. But you might say, hey now, that CNN clip said the rescue operations were expensive. $13 million a month. That means $156 million a year. This has nothing to do with people dying, silly YouTube man. It's simple economics. This is all about saving money and the EU not blowing through its budget. It's tragic, but the reality of the world we live in is that we just can't afford to save all those people. Okay, setting aside the callousness of that statement, let's look at some numbers. This is Frontex's budget over time. See how the rectangles keep getting bigger? That means the agency's getting more money. How much? The proposed budget for 2021 was 543 million euros, way more than Mare Nostrum, the rescue operations from the CNN clip, ever cost. It gets worse. 
5.6 billion euros are being set aside for 2021 through 2027, a nearly 200% increase from the previous cycle. If you needed a people-saving budget, you got it. But the majority of this money isn't going towards saving more people in dire, frightening situations. It's going into making border crossings even more difficult and even more lethal. For starters, Frontex is expanding what it calls its standing cops. Oops, sorry, that's a typo. Uh... Frontex is expanding its standing core. It's getting more boots on the ground to carry out its violent border enforcement and pushback policies. 10,000 people by 2027 to be exact. Nearly double the number currently in place. People whose jobs will be to stand at border crossings or get on boats patrolling the Mediterranean, armed and intimidating anyone trying to get past. On top of all that, surveillance drones are now being used to catch people fleeing to the EU through the Mediterranean. Drones. To catch people fleeing for their lives with nothing in their pockets through the most deadly border in the world, Frontex is shelling out 100 million euros on military surveillance equipment to fly over the Mediterranean. It's insane. And yet that's still somehow not everything Frontex is doing to make the EU's borders even deadlier. One other thing Frontex does is collaborate with non-EU states like Libya to complement pushbacks with another appalling practice. Pullbacks. Pullbacks work like this. Frontex tells the Libyan Coast Guard when it catches migrants out at sea, so that those people fleeing the country can be pulled back. Where do they get pulled back to? Into quote, concentration camp-like conditions, managed by Libyan militias, basically robbing them of the freedom to leave their country. In another case of countries collaborating with Frontex, the Greek Coast Guard actually fired at a ship carrying migrants, handicapping one of them when the bullet hit a 19-year-old's lower back. Look. So far, I've given you an eclectic mix of policy, budget, and real-life examples of what Frontex does to make European borders a living hell for people just looking for a decent, safer life. And you probably think I'm done. Frankly, I should be. It's just good video sense to stop here and move on to something else. But I still somehow have more, and I'm going to tell it to you because it's important. We can add to the list of problems I've already named a built-in, institutional issue that makes all these problems worse. One of Frontex's EU-mandated responsibilities is doing, quote, risk analysis at European borders. They report to the EU every year how much of a, quote, risk migrants at the border pose to Western Europe. You can probably already tell where I'm going here. The obvious result of this kind of power is that Frontex can just say things are getting worse, stoke the existing xenophobic fears within the EU, and by that process get more money to militarize their operations even more than they already are, more freedom to use violence against migrants, and generally nurture an anti-immigration rhetoric that makes them look like the good guys when immigrants are electrocuted onto boats and set adrift at sea. This isn't just an internal to the EU government thing either. It's a responsibility that weaves Frontex into the very fabric of European society. As part of this risk analysis, Frontex creates maps that get used by news outlets to make immigration look terrifying, like it's some kind of invasion or a war, instead of the reality that immigration is a pretty normal thing that happens and is just periodically exacerbated by conflicts, climate events, and insecurity. News outlets use these scary maps, like all the time. Letting Frontex be in charge of risk analysis is like getting a four-year-old to be the arbiter of how much candy four-year-olds should get. Except the candy is military equipment and the four-year-old is racist. Because not only is this violence carried out on a massive scale, it's primarily done against black and brown migrants. People migrating from majority non-white countries in Africa and the Middle East, escaping equally horrific situations as those seen recently in Ukraine, do not benefit from a safe corridor into the EU like their white peers have these past few months. That's not to knock the access Ukrainians, and specifically white Ukrainians, have gotten. Excluding the racism, that general trend of support for migrants is great. The problem is that not everyone is benefiting from it. It's highly discriminatory and will likely only become even worse as the EU plans to increase its use of biometric and artificial intelligence tools at the borders. The takeaway here is that Europe is actively militarizing its borders and pumping its most violent and discriminatory agency with cash. It's shocking, and yet if you're from the EU, there's a good chance you haven't heard that much about it. At least not for a while or in any specific detail. But you have heard of the southern border wall put up by Trump. Why is that? Well, part of the answer is that in Western liberal societies, there's a tendency to view Europe with rose-tinted glasses. Europe has a better regulatory apparatus, so EU citizens receive decent protections from some of the worst examples of corporate cost-cutting. People in Europe have a comparatively high standard of living, and some of their politicians willingly embrace socialist language. Programs like healthcare are even socialized in some EU countries. 
All throughout the Schengen area, people are free to move and live wherever they want. Homelessness and poverty aren't quite as endemic as in the US and other countries in the Imperial Corps. While it's not a socialist institution, the EU seems like a nicer, more livable form of a capitalist government. Pleasant, even. More so than here, at least. And within that framework, that specific image of the EU, Frontex's actions seem like an externality, an outgrowth, something that can be reformed away. It doesn't feel like it's really part of the EU, therefore it can be changed. Doesn't it feel like we could just blame Frontex on the far right and its sizable place in the EU Parliament? Or on quote unquote racist countries like Hungary or Poland or Italy or Turkey or Greece? If the EU seems like a quote nice place, it starts to feel like Frontex and all its horrible violence is just a deviation from the spirit of the EU. And that therefore we can simply regulate it better, submit it to more scrutiny, and reform it into shape so that it fits within the rest of the picture. But that analysis is misguided at best. Not only has reform been tried and failed, Frontex isn't some kind of anomaly. It is part and parcel of the European Union. It is a necessary part of the specific way the EU functions. And you can actually see that with the amount of support Frontex gets from every single part of the EU. Back in 2015, Frontex got its mandate extended by the European Commission, then support from the European Council three days later, which it followed up with a positive vote by the European Parliament. That's the three main EU institutions. This isn't some pet project carried out by a minority of countries or a far-right parliamentary group within the EU. The whole of the EU stands behind Frontex. The reason for that support is that the EU isn't the rose-tinted bastion of nice capitalism we tend to see it as, but rather an example of how you can build an acceptable yet incredibly violent capitalism by pushing the most egregious violence out of sight, outside of Union borders, to the Union's poorest countries, or onto your most marginalized people. If the EU seems acceptable, it's because its niceties are built on a ruthless brutality it has successfully made invisible and disassociated itself from. It's not the EU's fault these migrants are dying, the Mediterranean is just a dangerous body of water, you see. But once you see the reality of the EU's advantages and what they're built on, it's impossible to think Frontex can be reformed away or made into a humane institution. The project it is tasked with undertaking and protecting is wrong at its very core. I just threw a lot of things at you and didn't explain them in much detail. To understand what I mean by all this, we need to briefly talk about imperialism and the role of borders in capitalist societies. The EU is an imperialist institution. More on that in the Marxist Paul video I talked about right at the start. But very briefly, that means that one of the chief ways the EU operates is through the transfer of wealth from colonized and generally worse off countries to itself. While historically that transfer has been done with boots on the ground colonialism, Today, money makes its way into the hands of the European elite primarily through unequal exchange. Third world countries are too desperate, after years of brutal exploitation, structural adjustment programs, and colonial theft, to take anything but the worst deal put on the table by Europe's multinational companies. And so money slowly trickles out of those countries and into the hands of private European firms, weakening and destabilizing these exploited countries in the process. Basically, European companies come in and make the deals that work for them because it's the only deal on the table. As you might expect, this kind of relationship makes exploited countries much more likely to fail or get pushed into conflict, particularly when resources like oil are at the center of this exploitative relationship, like we've seen all over the Middle East. Wars mean refugees, and refugees mean migration to the safer and wealthier countries who enrich themselves through this pillaging of the global south. At the root cause of migration coming into the EU is the EU itself. Both its past colonialism it's never apologized for nor rectified, and the present neo-colonialism it actively engages in. But that doesn't say anything about borders. That's because borders come at the end of this equation. After Europe has happily plundered the global south and made it difficult for it to develop, Fortress Europa can safely hide behind hard borders. Hard borders not only attempt to stop the people it has brutalized from seeking refuge from the consequences of its actions, meaning that Europe gets to keep the profits of its exploitation squarely to itself and its native population, they also serve a secondary purpose, creating or otherwise upholding the idea of an undeserving migrant forcing their way in, which it turns out is incredibly useful to capitalist societies. Capitalism requires competition between workers to function, and a divided labor force is a great way to achieve that. By bringing into the labor force a group of people more desperate than the native population, capitalists are able to pit immigrants and native workers against one another and use that competition to lower wages and therefore increase their profits. 
Basically, add poorer, more desperate people into the competition and wages should go down while profits go up, at least in theory. According to that logic, it seems like it would be in the capitalist's interest to tear down borders and have completely open immigration. But that's exactly backwards. Borders aren't there to stop immigration flow into wealthy capitalist countries entirely. Stopping immigration is impossible. No border is airtight, and most people labeled illegal make it in through legal means but stay beyond their authorized date. No, borders and trigger-happy deportation agencies like ICE and Frontex are there not to actually stop everyone from getting in, but to differentiate workers from here and workers from there. To draw a legal distinction between citizens and second-class other that can be shoehorned into playing the role of the threat. Capitalists do not want the free movement of people across borders. They want the movement of people without rights. Borders and an entire anti-immigration apparatus create that idea and make it very clear who it applies to. And the results are pretty obvious. A lack of rights and this idea of being on thin ice creates a massive amount of insecurity for migrants, making those who do make it through willing to endure more abject and less well-paid work. Think about it. Would you make a fuss if your employer could threaten you with deportation? Probably not. This makes hard borders self-justifying. They literally create the very idea of a desperate immigrant ready to steal your job, which can be turned around and used by neoliberal politicians to harden borders even more, or simply defend out of principle. And the beauty of this whole thing for capitalists is that there doesn't need to be an actual tangible flow of immigrants into the country to trigger this kind of effect. The fear of your job being taken over by an immigrant is enough to create insecurity in native workers and make them that little bit less resistant to worsening working conditions, longer hours, or lower pay. Immigration doesn't actually need to trigger competition for lower wages. It just needs to create that fear in the domestic labor force. The idea that we need hard borders is enough to make you think that you don't deserve to ask for more. So what do we do with this information? As someone who probably lives in the wealthy countries putting up hard borders, not only should you not want to stop immigration, you need to recognize that you will never be able to. Not only is it weird to be opposed to immigration in the first place, if you think it's messed up when a country doesn't let people leave, then you also need to be okay with people going somewhere when they do. That's just basic logic. There's also just a practical argument for open immigration. A practical case on top of the human case for not wanting to see people suffer. Here it is. People will always get through even the most violent and well-policed borders. And so long as they do, you'll keep hearing about immigrants as threats, coming in to steal your job and making it more difficult to stand up for yourself. When you hear socialists advocate for open borders, and measures like guaranteed housing and food assistance, it's in your best interest as a worker to support that effort when you and an immigrant are both on the same footing and united against unjust treatment by your boss. If your boss can't threaten to replace one of you with the other because you both have the same standards, you won't be taken advantage of. No immigrant is going to be there to steal your job if he won't take a worse deal than you in the first place. To continue to advocate for stronger borders, to mistreat immigrants when they arrive in your country, or permanently deny them full legal equality is shooting yourself in the foot. And I'm not saying this because I love immigration or anything. Immigration can be an incredibly traumatic and difficult experience. I wouldn't wish it on anyone who's not seeking it out. I'm saying that we should do our best to make immigration as voluntary a process as possible by stopping it at the root, meaning no longer messing around and destabilizing foreign countries for profit. And when immigrants do come to the Imperial Corps, treating them like we want to be treated, like we all deserve to be treated especially after how much we benefit from treating them poorly in their home countries. National borders at their very core make that nearly impossible. That's why you can't reform an institution like Frontex. You'd only be defending an institution ready to hurt you and people looking for a safe and decent life to help somebody else's profits. Stop spending your energy blocking immigrants from a decent life. Help your fellow human and you'll help yourself in the process. As I mentioned earlier, this video was made in collaboration with Marxist Paul. As some of you may know, I was recently in the hospital for a few days, which really threw off my production schedule. This video was supposed to come out last week. I've actually never missed an upload in all my years on YouTube, so this was a big deal for me. Paul was super accommodating and his video is fantastic, so definitely go check it out, and consider supporting his Patreon if you like what you see. There are links in the pinned comment. Thank you all for your continued support, I hope you enjoyed this week's collab, and I'll see you next week.